Hello everyone, welcome to the ESG webinar, Virtual Computing Infrastructures. My name is Jen and I will be your host. Procuring virtual computing infrastructures is going to become more of a business decision than most IT organizations are accustomed to. Are you ready? The buyers of virtual computing infrastructures are not concerned with the speeds and feeds of the infrastructure. They are focused on business priorities, time to market or cycle time, and ultimately improving IT service levels to the businesses they support. Server virtualization and cloud computing are acting as the ideal catalyst to introduce this strategy to mainstream IT and change the way businesses consume IT infrastructure. Before we get started, I have a couple of housekeeping items to review. Mark's presentation should take about 30 to 45 minutes. Afterwards, he will take questions. Throughout Mark's presentation, please feel free to enter your questions using the control panel. In addition, we are recording today's webinar and will be posting it on the website along with all of Mark's other work at www.esg-global.com. With that said, I'd like to introduce Mark. Mark Barker champions ESG's data center transformation practice, focusing on all things virtualization and cloud computing. In his current role, Mark researches the various virtualization technologies available and the impact these solutions have on IT strategies and the broader marketplace. Okay, Mark, take it away. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you, everybody else, for joining the call as well. So let's go through a quick agenda of the call and what we're going to talk about, and then we'll kind of get right into things. Um, the first thing I do want to mention is there's an, a complete market landscape report, which is actually an entire white paper on this subject that we will share a link to you, or Jen will share a link with you at the end. Um, and you'll be able to actually have access to that as well. So keep that in mind as we go through here, uh, and the slides will be made available to you as Jen said as well. So the first thing we'll talk about is what is virtual computing infrastructure, virtualization, obviously acting as a big catalyst, uh, lots, of lots of different choices there. We'll go through some of those different choices. We'll talk about the trade-offs of the different decisions you'll make, and we'll, that will become obvious as we kind of walk through. We'll talk about a specific use case reference guide, calling out some use cases we see that are popular in the industry and how they may or may not match to specific virtual computing infrastructures. Then we'll talk about planning for that investment. And also as part of this project, um, we uh, spoke with nine different vendors and we have a little bit of a vendor review in the uh, final slides of this presentation as well. So. When we think of uh, virtualization, specifically x86 virtualization, there's a lot of different choices we can make. Um, we really term that virtual computing infrastructure, really that physical server uh, networking storage that sit underneath that virtualized uh, platform, that hypervisor. The first one, most of you on the phone and listening in are really familiar with do it yourself. So this is the one that I became very familiar with as well when I was in IT. So I kind of like to share the story. Used to take all these different pieces, go to a computer fair, start plugging all these different pieces in, throw them on the kitchen table, and then my mother said, what are you doing? That's never gonna work. What do those pieces do? And start asking a bunch of questions. A few hours later, you start plugging them all back in and ultimately you end up with a PC at that time that was actually up and working. Um, but it was really the do-it-yourself model. I kind of use the analogy of this is like wanting to build a shed, going to the local big box lumber store, buying the two by fours, buying some nails and screws and whatever other materials you may need, loading them all up in your vehicle and going home and then trying to figure out how it's done and ultimately at some point ending up with something that resembles a shed. In IT, a lot of times we end up with something that resembles this picture here which while it works, it uh, still has it, uh, this is really around do it yourself and taking all these different pieces together and putting them uh, in a way that actually work or meet the needs of your business or uh, environment, whatever you may be doing. Very common solution. Uh, by no means do I say people are running away from this quickly. A lot of us grew up in this environment, still pride ourselves very much in this expertise and have really taken uh, IT quite far just in all the things that we've learned and how we put them together. Sometimes we've all been guilty of using a little super glue, duct tape, and bailing wire, but at the end of the day, ultimately things are working. So as an alternative, um, you've got the virtual computer infrastructure up at the top again. You've got do-it-yourself, which we just went over. The other way, and the one that we see that we are becoming more and more interested, is an integrated computing platform. With integrated computing platforms, you really have two different methods of consumption. And that's using a reference architecture, which we'll talk about in a minute, 
or more of a pre-configured solution. This is more of the turnkey type of environment uh, as you deploy that infrastructure. So just quick overview. You've got virtual computing infrastructure. You've got different ways you can do that, do it yourself or integrated computing platform. The rest of what we're really focused on here are those reference architectures of those pre-configured solutions. So here with the reference architecture, I'll bring up the shed idea again. Here, instead of just going to the lumber yard and buying a bunch of raw materials and seeing how they're all gonna fit together and then making a bunch of trips back and forth, you've done a little bit of planning ahead of time. You've actually designed things on paper, worked with an architect potentially, but you have a blueprint that ultimately at the end of the day you're able to use to actually put up that shed so you know how much material to buy, how many nails, how many two by fours, what roofing material you need, etc. So now when you build that shed, you've got what you need, you don't have to run back and forth, you can do it all at once. Reference architectures have been around for a while inside of IT, they aren't anything new. Uh, I put a couple examples up here on the right hand side uh, from the different vendors. But here it's really a, uh, a document that's used as a guideline uh, to set up some architecture um, when it comes down to server storage and networking. Where we see these being used typically is around a specific application. So I remember using these years ago around Microsoft Exchange, for example. Knowing what the, har what the hardware, what the best practices are, what the configuration is, and ultimately guiding me through to get that Exchange environment up and running in a production environment. So here, this is the let's do a little bit of planning, design work, even leaning on some of the vendors or a set of vendors together to provide me that architecture or blueprint for my virtual computing or integrated infrastructure approach. The next option that we're seeing become pretty interesting is a pre-configured solution. So here, go back to the shed idea. Here is I go to the uh, shed store and essentially the shed shows up and I pick it out and the shed shows up in my yard, all assembled, rolls off the trailer, I can start putting my rake, shovel, lawnmower in there immediately. Same idea here with the pre-configured solution. So now I've got a set rack typically of server storage and network that are integrated from the factory or basically integrated right when they get delivered to me right off the truck or into the loading dock. They're fully rack and stacked, they're cabled, um, all I'm essentially doing is plugging in some power to them, sliding them into wherever my data center is, providing the, the cooling that goes with them, and really giving them network connectivity. Ultimately, what we're seeing here is more and more engineering actually being designed into these systems as well. So, well, truthfully, I think a lot of it is just taking what we know with server storage and networking and putting them together. We're seeing a lot more engineering take place here where those, those components are actually engineered and designed to truly be delivered in that turnkey approach. At the end of the day, um, really the, the, the savings are measure, measured a lot different than what we're looking at. The savings are measured in time savings. I'm able to quickly turn things on. I've seen people take this pre-configured solution and within 24 or 48 hours actually moving it immediately into a production environment, quickly turning on virtual machines, ultimately focusing on what is at hand with their project right from the beginning, as opposed to doing burn in time, testing configuration, and even scratching their head a little bit, wondering if it's gonna work or how it's gonna work. So here's a pre-configured solution, out of the box, ready to go, turn it on, get immediate productivity out of it. So again, just a quick review, you got those different choices, do it yourself. By no means am I saying people are running away from this method. We still see a lot of this even in virtualized environments. We'll go through a couple of use cases in a minute where I see tra people transitioning to more of that integrated platform approach. Um, when it comes to that point, you really have that reference architecture, that pre-configured solution you're looking at. We started to look at this, so at ESG, we do a lot of market research. We do a lot of online web-based survey. Where we're out trying to understand where the market is going, what are some challenges, and what are some drivers out there in the market. About 18 months ago, we asked, how would you describe your organization's interest level in integrated computing platforms? And this really piqued my interest. 10% at that time were already using some type of integrated computing platform uh, for their virtualized computing infrastructure. Then, then immediately I look and I say, wow, another 11% are interested in doing this, uh, are very interested, another 26% interested, and then another 29% someone interested. So understanding having those pieces glued together, integrated together, 
um, taking away some of that routine or mundane work that IT has performed in the past was certainly of interest to the people that we were surveying here, over 600 of them. So over time, what we've done is actually surveyed and asked that question more. This year, as ESG does on a yearly basis, we do an IT spending intention survey. Here, really looking to understand what are IT's top priorities, business top priorities, and where is spending taking place. The interesting question we asked here, and let's kind of walk through this research and what it means, is this is which of the following best describes your organization's current infrastructure for its virtualization private cloud environment? And then which would you believe your organization's preferred infrastructure? So current is on the left in the blue colored columns, and preferred is on the right hand side in the yellow columns. So here across the bottom, I have those different virtual computing infrastructures and consumption models. First thing that stands out to me is do it yourself. So most 46% of organizations here using that do it yourself consumption model. What's interesting is if you look what the preferred one, it significantly drops off to 28%. If we shift right over and look at the orange box I have outlined, fully integrated solution, 24% saying that they actually have that deployed as part of their uh, virtualized private cloud environment today and significantly jumping up as their preferred deployment. So here, when I ask people, I speak with people, I, show, I ask them even by show of hands, who's using what type of infrastructure, people are beginning to see the value of putting these components together, putting server storage, networking, uh, tightly integrating it, and ultimately handing some of that responsibility off to the vendors um, or even the channel in some cases to actually put this together for me um, so essentially I can shift other tasks and responsibility inside of IT and don't have to worry about that core putting the pieces together and whether it's going to work and how it's going to work or how it may perform. The other question that we've asked is we always want to know well, what benefits do you believe an integrated computing platform offers for your organization? So here we can look at the top couple which are pretty interesting. The biggest thing I notice here is it's not about performance, it's not about um, those typical speeds and feeds as Jenny was saying earlier. It's actually about ease of management, for instance, being able to easily manage across those different environments, server, storage, networking, and really tying that into whatever your virtualization management solution is as well. Faster deployment time. I'm going to use a use case in a second around VDI, specifically virtual desktop infrastructure. And we'll use an example there how faster how deployment time was significantly reduced based on the integrated computing solution that this company chose. Overall total cost of ownership, just remember what's getting measured there is really the time to market and really how I'm actually distributing my IT team as opposed to looking at those individual components as you do that calculation. And then really the other thing is less, less uh, resources required, um, reduces interoperability, and the other one you'll see that we'll call out in a minute is support. So here are some key things that people really see as being the benefits of that integrated computing approach. The other thing we ask in that same IT spending survey we do is we always like to understand, and as we're in IT, you know, what are the things that are going to really help me justify that investment? So this question here, we ask which of the following considerations do you believe will be the most important in justifying IT investments to your organization's business management team over the next 12 to 18 months? The thing we call out here, and the reason I included this piece of research is here it's business process improvement, even more important than overall cost reduction. We're finding more and more that that business process improvement metric or being able to use that consideration as you're justifying the investment in, for this example, integrated computing solutions, begins to be able to take that level of conversation to the next level where it's not, oh, we just need a new server, we need more storage capacity, we need more network switching. Here the conversations change to based on the business process that we may be able to improve and it may be from an overall revenue generation perspective, it may be from a productivity perspective, but really looking at that infrastructure differently and being able to say, well, now we're going to collapse, choose to purchase that integrated computing approach based on how that improves business. And we see this working very good, really not only looking at the economics of the solution, how it's going to mitigate risk inside of our IT environment, but also looking at that business, pro business process improvement metric. 
So one thing we did in this full um, table here is actually inside the report that we'll give you guys a link to as well. But really looking at the disadvantage or the advantages and disadvantages of each of these consumption models. And it's ultimate understanding the trade-offs between them. So we'll start with do-it-yourself in the left-hand most column. And really, we mentioned this around do-it-yourself. I'm really familiar with it. It leverages my existing skill. It's really the environment I've grown up in, been trained on. Um, I understand whatever server vendor you may be using, their tools um, and their process that they're using. You even understand it from a procurement perspective as well. Um, you have that relationship. And also with the, with the DIY method, you really get to take that best of breed approach, um, which is very important to many IT organizations. Let's face it, when we do it, not only do they call out that picture that looked a little complex and the messy inside that IT environment that I showed, but it can be complex. I know I found myself doing a lot of things the first time, uh, every time type of approach, which was time consuming, meant that I was there late nights and weekends trying to figure things out, ultimately getting it all work, but it was very time consuming in doing so. Um, you do need to be familiar if you're putting all those different pieces together, you have to have some knowledge across those different pieces, or now you're pulling in all those different uh, disciplines inside your organization. So. If you're in an organization that's big enough, you're pulling together somebody from the storage team, networking team, server team, OS team, uh, and virtualization team, all to make that work together, which can be uh, a big hurdle all in itself. Support comes from those different vendors. Guess what happens? DIY. Uh, we have a problem. We bring everybody into the room. What's everybody do? They point fingers at everybody else, um, really trying to figure out what that is um, in that model uh, of deployment. And then management across those different solutions, depending on what they are, can be different, difficult depending on the type of visibility or root cause analysis that you may need. So if we shift over to the middle one, reference architecture, remember this is really that blueprint approach where I've got that design, that architecture in place, certainly helps simplify things. We know that somebody, usually a trusted vendor, has gone through and taken that guesswork out of things, actually taken that document, given me something to follow, or something I could hand over to my team that they can begin to, to follow based on what I made it be deploying. Very much, very typical uh, to have those reference architectures based around a specific application. One of the things with reference architecture, assembly may not be included, so I may still be left to do that. Basically taking what that reference architecture uh, says, putting together something through procurement, and making that uh, actual purchase of those different pieces, and then I may have to still put it together, which is fine. We're seeing some system integrators actually offering that build option. So being able to work with them and them being able to take those components together and provide that service and support and consultative nature is also uh, could be of very interest to some of you as well, depending on your relationship there. And the other thing is to be aware of a reference architecture, it's not always customizable. Once you step outside that reference architecture, um, you still put yourself at kind of step over in that DIY model a little bit knowing that you've set some baseline from a reference architecture, but you're still bringing in and maybe a workload or a specific tool that you're using or even a specific hardware that you're using that may not fit into that uh, reference architecture list. From the pre-configured solution, this gets pretty interesting. It actually starts to eliminate that whole test and build process. So I don't have to uh, stand it all up, burn it in, unbox everything, cable everything. I may be able to quickly get that time to value as I mentioned before. Um, one of the very interesting things that I see in what I call IT director level and above folks that I talk to, they like the common support model. They like the fact that they can call one number and that can be supported uh, and they can say we have this integrated solution that's approved by you and can quickly get to that problem resolution as opposed to taking the time on the phone to figure out which of the different pieces you have, how they're connected. And typically this comes in with virtualization probably with a performance problem. Um, but it, with an integrated pre-configured solution, you're able to quickly, the idea is that you're able to quickly get to that common support model, quickly shift through what that troubleshooting may be. Another thing here is it takes that takes some of those organizational boundaries down. So in the past where I mentioned those different IT disciplines having to align and work together with each other, pre-configured solution can help that because you don't necessarily have to have that deep expertise across all those different IT disciplines. You can, all, you can take that more pre pre-configured solution and focus really on in this case turning on virtual machines starting to manage that environment 
The other thing, ultimately over time, and I think this is still a to be considered or to be determined, is patches, updates, and software. Um, ultimately, those revisions being pushed out to that system are going to be the responsibility of the vendor. Um, I can see it someday becoming more of a, okay, here's a USB stick with the patches and being able to make that happen. And based on virtualization, things start moving around. But I do think we're a ways away from that co people comfortably doing that inside their IT organization. With a pre-configured solution, things scale in large margins. So be careful. I, we are seeing some examples in the market where they are actually are coming down market. So there are uh, what I'd say targeted towards a not hundreds or not thousands of virtual machines, but maybe hundreds in some cases. So that's good to see. Um, some of the initial costs become actually uh, a premium. That's one of the questions we get often. Um, there's a question about vendor lock-in. What does that mean? How, where I was doing best to breed in the past. Now I'm kind of committed to a vendor and some people are very nervous about how that falls into their environment. Um, you may have to get new training if you're actually switching over to a different system or switching vendors altogether should be something to think about. And the thing that becomes important is actually that right sizing or capacity planning exercise you do becomes very important. Um, these systems aren't designed to say one project, one system, let's go off and get it. These are systems that are really you're placing a investment on your future strategy inside your data center. And you have to know, understand how you're going to align that capacity so, you're, so you continue to operate at optimized capacity in your environment. So the next thing we'll do is we'll walk through some specific use cases here to understand how these different solutions uh, may or may not match to use cases that we see uh, typically aligning with some of these integrated computing solutions. So the first one, as great as server virtualization is, uh, it's rare that I see something that is not doing it at all. Most of what we see out there is still focused on consolidation and cost containment. Being the case, that's where people have quickly been able, and I'm sure many of you fall into this, quickly been able to get to that 20-30% of workloads, one that you know, ones that you're familiar with. Um, very much a DIY type of model, being able to take either existing infrastructure, existing vendor relationship, um, existing organizational expertise or discipline, and being able to apply that to virtualization, taking on that DIY model, but what we're seeing and we say often is that first 20, 30% is pretty easy or relatively easy to achieve. That next 5% can be very difficult when it comes to scale, complexity, performance, availability needs. And that's when it may make sense to start looking at some of the other ones, other type of architectures when you get beyond that stage. Here, a reference architecture, well, interesting, interesting take some visionary focus inside of IT to recognize where you're going where people here are starting to focus on different tier one type of applications or have an application in their environment may start to look at this reference reference architecture approach if your sole purpose with server virtualization is on consolidation cost containment pre-configured solution is likely today not a great fit you're likely to be able to take that diy method be able to run with where you're going still focus on consolidation and cost containment and then maybe consider as you move down the road, some of the opportunity around pre-configured solutions. The next use case is really that next phase of adopt, adoption with server virtualization. Here, we've done consolidation and cost containment. Everybody's running around IT, giving each other high fives. Uh, everybody's been able to even advance themselves from a career perspective. But now we're starting to look at mission critical and business critical applications. This is kind of what I say, it's time to work with the server huggers. So here, no question, if you've got the IT expertise, you can maybe be able to maintain or be able to still focus on that DIY infrastructure. But as you look at some of those uh, other applications, Microsoft Back Office, SAP, Oracle, I mean, the list goes on, you may be looking at ways where it's recommended because the masses have not done this. If you're looking for recommendation about how have they deployed that, maybe using a reference architecture to understand how can I uh, confidently deploy that application on this, on this uh, reference architecture? Here also it can help expedite things, take the guesswork out, uh, and be a good baseline of a way that I can actually get that application up and running on that environment quickly. 
I also think here pre-configured solutions uh, have an interesting approach. Um, the thing that I don't like to see out in the market is when vendors are taking an application by application approach. So when I see an integrated computing solution focused on just Microsoft Exchange, that's probably great for a small segment of the market that has an exchange environment that is tens of thousands of mailboxes. But for those of us that may have a much smaller environment, these pre-configured or these virtualized environments are typically mixed workload environments. And you've got to be able to understand how that pre-configured solution is going to work across those different environments as well. So if you're looking at mission critical, business critical application, just think about how that would match to a pre-configured solution and be thinking about things like, what about availability? What about security? What about disaster recovery in those environments? And that's when the pre-configured solution can get interesting. If you're having more of a IT as a service or data center as a service initiative in there, that gets interesting too, as you can actually turn those uh, virtual machines uh, in or over to some of those application or server huggers, as I call them. The other interesting use case around uh, integrated computing is virtual desktop infrastructure, so VDI. I'm going to start at the bottom this time and work up. So the leading use case on pre-configured solutions is actually VDI. When we talk to these different vendors, there's nine different vendors that we spoke with, including in this report, their leading use case in deployment was actually VDI. And think about why this is. It's complex. There's a lot of, com there's a lot of different pieces to it. It evolves everything out to an endpoint all the way down to a spinning disk where your data ultimately lies somewhere. And at the end of the day, if this doesn't work, you have users that aren't being productive, you've made an investment that isn't working, um, you failed in what you're ultimately trying to solve in the first part. So it makes sense that VDI is a leading work case just from an overall value prop of these pre-configured solutions being quick time to market, being able to do it confidently, being able to do it successfully, and having that proven system uh, where it comes in. This is one of the examples where we actually saw within 48 hours of the pre-configured solution being uh, basically rolled off the truck into a customer's loading dock, being able to uh, have a virtual desktop up and running in production environment, and being able to roll it out to the first set of users using that pre-configured solution. Reference architectures, in this case, certainly interesting. We see a lot of proof of concepts being built around reference architectures. Uh, the leading vendors there, Citrix, Microsoft Quest, and VMware, certainly have that implementation guidance and reference that uh, you can certainly use and look at um, as you're kind of looking at those different VDI type of employments. Uh, it does help to predict what that infrastructure may look like, and it starts to give you visibility into those different components and pieces. We've actually seen pieces, people here that look at reference architecture and once they see some of the complexity and uh, that integration that's involved, start to look at that pre-configured solution just of what, what it can eliminate just from an overall uh, work or labor from an IT perspective. There's no question I can give you examples where I've seen VDI deployed in that DIY type of environment. Um, and it certainly uh, can work well for a smaller proof of concepts. And where we see people here, it's typically we've done some consolidation and cost containment with server virtualization. Now we see desktop virtualization as being that interesting next step. How do we take that and what do we do? Maybe using DIY just to get things up and running and from a proof of concept perspective. But it can be very complex and that sheer complexity or just scale of that environment can stop people from uh, doing it in that DIY method. And then what any good IT conversation uh, these days uh, without talking about cloud computing? So here, this is ultimately taking server virtualization, um, really just simply stating that putting intelligent management on top of that virtualized environment to enable things like self-service provisioning, quick elasticity, scalability, um, self-service uh, in that environment. Um, or even doing some usage-based billing and track back as well. So here I'll take this one bottom up again. Um, if you have a clear, well-defined private cloud or cloud computing uh, initiative, um, being able to, we've seen people actually take a building block type of approach where they may have many offices, not just what I'd say their regional headquarters, but being able to take this pre-configured solution, that building block, and actually deploy it 
um, out to many different remote office branch offices for for example but here you really know when some of these systems have some of those core cloud tenants built into it reference architecture certainly possible being able to get to that value of cloud from that perspective um, this one's pretty interesting I think that where pre-configured solutions often focus across all those different cloud attributes some of the reference architectures may just focus on one or two of them so for example sure I want cloud computing but what's real important to me is self-service so now I look at a reference architecture maybe bolted on with some type of management uh, or provisioning type of software now I'm able to bolt that together with server storage and networking being able to turn up that private cloud infrastructure using some reference architecture design a lot of times with the DIY method of cloud computing uh, really comes down to taking more of an open source type of approach really involves an application architects application developers on staff to be able to do this um, we've certainly seen cases where they have done this uh, most of the pre-configured solutions that we see out there today are focused on what I'd say commercially available x86 virtualization solutions um, if somebody is looking to build what I'd say more of an open source type of cloud environment we're certainly seeing that with do it your do it yourself type of model but again very focused on shops and organizations that have enterprise IT uh, expertise and staff around application development and architecture so really just to pull it all up and Jenny said this best at the beginning is really procuring these virtual computing infrastructures is going to be very different than the way people procure server storage networking in the past um, a lot of times it was about we need the latest and latest and greatest server architecture uh, storage system architecture based on what the vendor may be offering at the time and here it's really going to be about what's that business process how have you improved it what's the impact um, economically how does it reduce risk how does it ultimately uh, really improve that business process are really going to come to the highlight when it comes to integrated computing approaches how does it differ from my present mode of operations and how does it fit into a longer term strategy so what am I doing today with virtualization around consolidation cost containment for example but what is my long term virtualization strategy am I just going to move those workloads that are good consolidation cost containment workloads or am I going to rely on that virtualized platform more and more for my x86 workloads and being able to apply those different management automation capabilities on top of that and at that point what's my goal or what is my vision with what's going to happen to that infrastructure that server storage networking I think it's a good opportunity if I'm inside of IT and I want to take an initiative uh, I'm part of that virtualization uh, team for instance and I want to take a good initiative inside that company and build our virtualized uh, investment it's a good opportunity to take it from a skill set perspective knowledge and lead a team from actually transforming what that infrastructure looks like and ultimately the ones that can align that with those top business priorities we've seen have great success with some of these early adoption of integrated computing uh, approaches that service and support model uh, second to last bullet is very important um, being able to quickly identify the system that you're running on quickly be able to get to that problem resolution becomes very important for somebody that's sitting in that what I'd say IT director CIO type of position where they want to know that they don't want a bunch of finger pointing happening at the team they want to call up yep we're running this integrated system this is the problem we're having and quickly be able to uh, find out what the root of the problem is based on the application they've been running on and the other thing is just watch out from a server virtualization perspective what that means um, some of these are sold with virtualization licenses some aren't just understand where it may or may not fit into your overall virtualization current virtualization investment and how that impacts your planning from an overall virtualization software licensing perspective so quick last couple slides we'll go over some of the vendors here and there's more detail on each of these vendors inside the report but here we'll just walk through the nine different vendors in alphabetical order of some of the th some of the ones that we talked to uh, in this specific market landscape report so the first one here and this is so, so you understand how we match things up and understand what's available out there in the market as you're out there kind of looking what the different options are so here you have Dell Dell has a pre-configured solution this is really roll it out of the truck out to your loading dock roll it inside your data center 
uh, and be able to turn things on. The same thing I mentioned, powered in, power in by plugging it in and uh, plugging a network cable and being able to get up and working. So this is their V-Start systems. This is a V-Start 50, 100, V-Start 200. Um, these are their pre-configured solutions. They are also a Microsoft Fast Track partner. So Microsoft uh, has a program um, putting together and I've actually recently included System Center 2012 instead of that program as well. But being able to build that uh, integrated solution based on the guidance and working with together with Microsoft and Dell is certainly one of the partners doing that. Fujitsu um, has been doing this for quite some time, um, mostly over in the European market, um, but they've been focused, for example, on that flex frame for SAP, being able to have that integrated approach specific for an application, which is a great example, being able to take server storage networking for a specific uh, enterprise type application, and also have DI blogs. Fujitsu is also a fast track partner, part of the Intel uh, Cloud Builder program, and they have something called Rapid Structure that's really that reference architecture for that virtualized platform. HDS uh, or Hitachi Data Systems here, they have um, a unified compute platform where Hitachi actually has their own um, compute blades. Um, as part of their uh, server solution. So they use that for a server, uh, part of their server storage and networking solution. Um, and then they're also a Microsoft Fast Track partner uh, as well, part of that same program I explained with the Dell and Fujitsu. HP has uh, shorthand is really VS1, VS2, VS3. These systems are that pre-configured solution right out of the box, quick time to value, HP, no surprise there, long time Microsoft Fast Track partner as well. So you see a couple of commonalities there where Microsoft Fast Track partner program very much aligned with Microsoft and Hyper-V in this case, and that applies to the same with IBM as well as part of that program here. Um, IBM also has Blade Center Foundation for Cloud with those different small, medium, and large sizes based on what you're looking at. So this is an initial snapshot of some of the initial vendors we uh, looked at on the first list. The next page, just to round out those nine, we have NEC, part of that Microsoft Fast Track program again. Um, they've got Cloud Platform uh, Standard Enterprise Data Center here, taking some of the stuff they're doing from a Blade perspective, tying in some of the stuff they're doing from a network and storage perspective as well. One of the unique ones on the list is actually NetApp. Uh, a storage company teaming up with Cisco, really now a server company, uh, and developing FlexPod. So FlexPod being able to take uh, server storage networking together, uh, going together, really being able to drive NetApp and Cisco being able to drive this through their different go-to-market channels, um, being able to have that solution that customers uh, take that integrated uh, computing approach as well. Um, both uh, part of the Microsoft Fast Track Partner Program here as well. Um, more recently, actually not in this report, more recently actually NetApp, uh, Cisco, and Microsoft as part of that fast track program even teamed up with Citrix, uh, being able to deliver actually a desktop virtualization solution across them as well. Oracle has a solution as well, very focused on their applications, but it makes perfect sense being able to take that application, deploy it on a very predictable infrastructure, um, using virtualizations for all its efficiencies, and being able to take that application running on top of it. VCE, here's a company that have taken um, three solutions in the market, really Cisco solutions, EMC solutions, and VMware, including Intel across them as well, and being able to design and build their VBlock series. So these are the series that actually come um, uh, delivered from uh, VCE, but really being built upon those three market leaders. So uh, that's a good uh, overview of those different types of virtual computing infrastructures out there. Gave you some good insight to the advantages and disadvantages, and I encourage you to take further look at the report as well. Um, looked at some specific use cases and also gave you a quick view of the vendors. So aside from please submitting any questions you have, with that, Jenny, I'll hand it back and over to you. Great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we do have a few questions from the audience, but before we get to those, I would just like to direct everyone to the QR code that you are now seeing on your screen. If you do not have a QR scanner, there's also the link below that. Uh, you can scan that or click that link and you will be taken to the slides from today's webinar and also a page where you can download a free copy of the Virtual Computing Infrastructure's Market Landscape Report. Okay, Mark, so the first question that came in uh, 
Is there an associated cost premium with integrated yeah. computing solution? Great question. So I get that question often. So the question really ultimately is, can I go off and purchase all these different components? Um, what's stopping me from doing that as opposed to what appears to be a premium if I buy them all together? So we've done a, we haven't done a lot of deep analysis here, but I have asked the question, have uh, worked with some IT organizations to look at this exact question. So what we've typically seen is the cost difference is really being able to be uh, sought after as the value of that integration uh, between the two. I suspected that the cost premium would be more than what I went into uh, originally thinking about things, um, but what we've seen is that it's actually flattened out more and it's really a shifting of if you're still um, doing a TCO analysis based on just that curse core server storage and networking, you need to consider other things about the time the market I mentioned, about that support cost and about freeing up those IT resources. And that's what ultimately begins to flip the scale and where people see the benefits of them. So that's a great question, Jenny. Okay, great. Uh, next question, are integrated computing solutions a viable option for a mixed workload environment? That one came up. So I'm sure when I mentioned that, I kind of skimmed over it real quick. So that one is, you got a pre-configured solution. We see a lot of them being targeted for a specific use case. We use VDI as a good example of that, um, where that's a single use case, single environment, predictable for the most part of what that environment is, assuming you've sized it right. Um, a lot of the other pre-configured solutions, we see the same thing. They're trying to target a specific workload, but we know the reality is, is most of these workloads or environments are mixed workload environment, meaning I've got server virtualization or virtual machine set up that may be typical IT owned, IT consolidation type of uh, workloads. And I wanna be able to run these with my business critical applications, uh, with even maybe alongside uh, staging or a test and de development environment as well. So how do I leverage that common pool of resources across all those different environments? Absolutely uh, can be done, we've seen it done. Um, the question there just becomes being able to size and plan for the right capacity there. And really for the most part, understanding where you're going, understanding what that environment looks like, um, how it's gonna grow over time and how you're gonna adapt to that uh, environment. So the answer is yes, definitely works in a mixed workload environment. Um, I think the vendors can do a better job educating everybody really what that means and how it fits. Um, but don't let the fact that you have a mixed workload environment stop you or negate you from looking at that integrated type of approach. Great question. Thank you, Mark. Uh, well, since we're running close to the end time, um, we'll let you go. Uh, we're sorry we could not get to all of your questions. A recording of this webinar will be available tomorrow on the ESG website. Again, that is www.esg-global.com. We'd like to thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you on future ESG webinars. Have a great day.